What we should recognize is, folks, that each story in its own way relates factors that are functionally equivalent. For instance, according to Matthew, the Annunciation is to Joseph, as I just mentioned. But according to Luke, the Annunciation is to Mary. But each announcement, each Annunciation, has the function of identifying the child to be born as the Messiah, and as God with us, or the Son of God. There's the truth. There's the truth. See? In Matthew, Magi come after the birth of Jesus to adore him. In Luke, shepherds come after the birth to adore him. Each scene has the function of showing that God's revelation in Jesus will be responded to by belief and praise, honoring Jesus and recognizing his honor. There's the truth. He is worthy of honor. He's not a lowlife. He's worthy of the honor of being cosmic Lord and Messiah, soon to return to inaugurate theocracy, Emmanuel. And Luke used the shepherds because he was an elite who was aware of Jesus' ministry to the poor and the oppressed. He was sensitive to that, whereas in some ways Matthew wasn't so, as sensitive to it. So he chose the Magi. Yeah, interesting. We have only one story from the first century of Magi traveling somewhere and visiting a king and then leaving another way. And you know who they were visiting? Caesar Nero. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that story might have influenced Matthew to include Magi? No, no, no. Caesar Nero, he isn't the real king. The real king is Jesus. Not Kaiser Neron. Moving right along. Maybe some of you are thinking, why cannot we suppose that one of the two birth accounts is the historical one, and the other is a symbolic story? Why are you raising doubts, Bill, in the historicity of both accounts? Some Catholics have, and Christians have indeed tried to respond to the differences among the birth narratives in this simplistic way. It's kind of like the diagram there. Find X. Here it is. And you just circle X. That's how a lot of Catholics and Christians are. When you confront them with this, they kind of give you a, re a retort that's like find X. Here it is. You know? Like, what followed, like a history, history question, what followed 1945? 1946. That solves that. The solution to the problem is to refuse that there is a problem, right? But that's a cop out. For some big C Catholics who think this way, and there's a whole lot. The choice for a historical account favors Luke, conveniently, because the joyous mysteries of our rosary draws heavily from the Lucan tradition. And Mary is featured prominently in Luke, and the guess is made that she was the source of that story, telling St. Luke what to write. <laughs> but Father Raymond Brown did not think the solution could be so simplistic because the criteria of historicity raises problems about events described by Luke as well as events described by Matthew. Here are some examples. Both Matthew and Luke describe events that certainly, if they had actually happened, would have left a record in the public arena. Matthew describes an unusual astronomical phenomenon, a star that rose in the east, seemingly leading the Magi to Jerusalem, then reappearing and coming to rest over the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem. In Birth of the Messiah, one of the sources for today's study, 
Raymond Brown examined every suggestion made from the astronomical records of the period of Jesus' birth. And there are copious amounts because the people didn't have television back then, folks, and they spent a lot of time outside looking at the sky vaults. Comets, conjunctions of planets, and supernova stars. It was apparent to Brown and many other scholars that no astronomical record exists of what is described in Matthew, despite occasional journalistic headlines and History Channel, Discovery Channel claims to the contrary. Is that the star? Oh, sorry, okay, it wasn't it. <laughs> In the case of Luke's census by Caesar Augustus of the whole world when Quirinius was governor of Syria, Luke takes great pains to kind of historically situate things. In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, that's how it's described. Caesar Augustus gives a, says a census that goes out to the whole world when Quirinius was governor in Syria. Well, we know when Quirinius was governor in Syria. A census that what presumably was made when Herod the Great was king of Judea. Well, we know when Herod the Great was king in Judea. These are three historical personages that have left a dent in the historical public record at the time. Caesar Augustus, Quirinius, governor of Syria, and uh, uh, Herod the Great. Again, in Birth of the Messiah, Raymond Brown examined all of the historical records about the governorship of Quirinius in Syria and censuses by Augustus. There never was a single census that covered the whole world under Augustus Caesar. Never. And the census of Judea, not involving Nazareth, that took place later under Quirinius occurred about 10 years after the death of Herod the Great and presumably after the birth of Jesus. So one is very hard-pressed, as it were, to think that either evangelist Matthew or Luke is painting an accurate picture of historic public events. Probably what happened is, after the resurrection, the birth of Jesus was associated with loose memories and phenomena that occurred in a period plus or minus 10 years around the event. Let's apply another criterion of historicity. If we're looking at Matthew or Luke as theological narratives, one would expect that what is narrated in the infancy narrative of, say, Matthew, Matthew chapter 1 and 2, to agree theologically and rhyme theologically with the meaning of Jesus expressed in Matthew chapters 3 through 28, the chapters which follow the infancy narrative. Does everybody see what I'm saying? According to Matthew chapter 2, when the Magi come to Herod the Great, and he and the chief priests and the scribes learned about the birth of the king of the Judeans, all Jerusalem was disturbed by the event. That's a big city, man. All Jerusalem is disturbed by the event. But then what happens later on when we see Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 and 56? Jesus came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogue. They were astonished and said, Where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? The tecton son. Is not his mother named Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not his sisters all with us? Where did this man get all this? Why would you ask such a dumb question like that? Didn't you remember a few decades back? A big parade of people come from the east with gifts. And caught everybody in Jerusalem was disturbed by this. The gossip network would have spread that everywhere. How did you miss that? Oh, that's right. I forgot. It didn't happen. 
the new cycle isn't like here. It's a 24 hour news cycle. No. <laughs> it's actually, uh, the news is carried by the gossip network, Linda. So they would have heard. Absolutely, they would have heard. These people are collectivists. They all would have heard. Do you know what happened in Jerusalem? No, what happened? Well, apparently, there was a star. And a child was born, and a whole bunch of dromedaries and people coming in from the east in a massive like parade come in, and Herod the Great was disturbed, and the whole city was in uproar. They would never have forgotten about that, folks. How can you then ask, don't you know who this is? This is the one who was born. Especially if it happened during their life. It happened during, of course, which it obviously did. These people are elders to Jesus. Let's look at this. Luke chapter 9, verse 7 to 9. This is even more startling, folks. Herod the Tetrarch. This is Herod Antipas. This is one of the sons of Herod the Great. After the Herod the Great died, his kingdom got split into different pieces. And, and one son got this, another son got that. Okay. Herod the Tetrarch. Arch, arch is Greek for arche rule, right? Tetrarch. Tetris 4. Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening... And he was greatly perplexed. All that was happening, meaning Jesus' ministry, the Jesus movement. And he was greatly perplexed because some were saying, John has been raised from the dead. Others were saying, Elijah has appeared. Still others, one of the ancient prophets has arisen. But Herod said, John I beheaded. Who then is this about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. He doesn't know who he is. How could you not know who he is? Your father tried to kill him. Question, if everyone was so disturbed by the birth of the true king of the Judeans, why is it that when the adult Jesus appears in the public ministry, nobody seems to know much about him or to expect anything from him, according to Matthew chapter 13, 54 to 56? In particular, Herod's son, Herod Antipas, knows nothing about Jesus in Luke chapter 9, Verses 7 to 9. Here's another thing. According to Luke, Elizabeth, mother of John the Dunker, was a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Therefore, according to Luke, the two children were related. They were kin, kinfolk, right? I mean, I don't know how many Catholics will, will, that I know that will, 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 will that would be ignorant of. No, John is John the Baptist. That's that's Jesus's cousin, right? That's immediately said, rolls right off the tongue. Mm -hmm. Yet in the public ministry, there is never a suggestion that John the Dunker is a relative, a close relative of Jesus. In John chapter one verse thirty-three, the Dunker says specifically two times, "I did not know him." <laughs> 